Assalamu alaikum everyone, and welcome back to another episode of I Jihad, a web series dedicated to deconstructing anti-Islam polemics while providing our viewers with the most accurate information on Islam and the Muslim world. I'm your host, the narrator, and this is my sidekick, Abu Ren. Today we'll be continuing our deconstruction of the popular ex-Muslim YouTuber, the Masked Arab. Hey Abu, fetch me his case file again so we can remind our viewers of what's already transpired. Thanks. Alright, let's see here. So, in the last episode, we analyzed the first set of videos in the Mass Arab series about ISIS and Islam. More specifically, his video on whether Islam advocates terrorism and extremism, and his video on whether Islam advocates killing innocent civilians. As such, we're now going to focus on his third video regarding offensive jihad. However, I will not be addressing his fourth video on suicide bombings, because I've already provided a comprehensive sociological and scriptural analysis of this phenomenon in episode 3, which you can find in the iJihad playlist. It is also recommended that you watch the previous episode of iJihad if you want to understand the full context behind this refutation. That said, we will continue to use the same method as before to critique his videos. That's right, I will be using the exact same sources as the masked Arab himself, showing where he has deceptively left out information to suit his own agenda. However, I will also add some additional references to strengthen my arguments along the way. So without further ado, let's begin, shall we? Hello and welcome. This video will be looking at offensive jihad. Not defensive jihad, no, the offensive type. One of the things that you will always hear from Islamic apologists is that jihad was only defensive and never offensive. This is completely false, as we've seen already in the verses mentioned in the previous videos. Well, if we're judging by the last two videos, let's just say that my expectations aren't very high. But we also know that the history of Islam, as written by Muslims, shows us many examples of battles and raids that were purely offensive, 100%. The dozens of raids I'm aware of were offensive, and some of the larger battles were too. In fact, the only battle that comes to mind which was defensive was the Battle of the Trench, which never really materialized into a battle anyway, as the Muslims dug a large trench around their city to prevent the Meccan pagans from entering. But even that came after many years of Muslims attacking the trade caravans of the Meccans and constantly being a significant nuisance to their trade. I'll quickly provide at least two examples where the jihad was definitely not defensive. The Battle of Badr is probably the most well-known battle that the Muslims were involved in at the time of Muhammad. It was their first major battle with the pagans of Mecca. The Muslims had decided to raid a trade caravan belonging to the Meccans, and the Meccans heard news of the plans that the Muslims had and sent out an army to protect the caravan. Many Muslims accept this and don't deny it, but others who really just can't come to admit that their prophet was starting these wars to steal and accumulate wealth have suggested that the Muslims were merely trying to get back what was stolen off them. Now, there is little evidence from within Islamic sources that the Meccans were actually stealing from the Muslims. But let's read about the build-up to this battle briefly in the main biography of Muhammad, otherwise known as the Sirah. They said that when the Apostle heard about Abu Sufyan coming into Syria, he summoned the Muslims and said, This is the Quraysh caravan containing their property. Go out to attack it. Perhaps God will give it as a prey. So the apologist excuses and explanations totally fail here, and it's clear that this is offensive jihad, not defensive in any way. Let's break it down. Firstly, Abu Sufyan is coming from Syria and going to Mecca, so the merchandise that he has cannot be that of the Muslims as it has just been brought from Syria. Secondly, Muhammad states clearly that it is their property. He didn't say that the Quraysh caravan was containing our property when he was speaking to the Muslims. Thirdly, he clearly provides an instruction to go and attack it. Then he says that they may get some war booty out of it. If you keep reading, you'd see that the Muslims didn't even expect Muhammad to go to war, and Abu Sufyan was anxious. So, it's really clear who is starting this war. Hint, hint, it's not the anxious one. Well, maybe it's the guy saying, go out to attack it. So, the Muslims initiated the Battle of Badr by trying to rob the Meccan pagans. So, according to the masked Arab, the Muslims just up and decided one day, unprovoked, to attack some random caravan because they wanted money. This is essentially his explanation in a nutshell. But is this really what happened, or is it yet again a case of dishonest omission? Well, in order to find the answer, all we need to do is refer to the very same source the masked Arab uses to make his case. Here, we find that he relies on a work by the famous Islamic historian Ibn Ishaq. 
a chronological biography of the Prophet Muhammad's life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, if we look at this source, we find that the Battle of Badr is mentioned on page 289. But for all you people out there with some basic reading comprehension skills, this should already seem a little suspicious. Why? Well, because with any chronological series of events, future events are often explained by past ones. So let's examine some of the earlier pages of this work so we can find out what those past events were. How about we start on page 119, where we first read about how the pagan Arabs treated the Prophet ﷺ prior to any military conflict. Here, we read about how the pagan Arabs tried to bribe the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ into allowing them to kill him just because he was preaching Islam. They, the pagan Arabs, said, O Abu Talib, your nephew has cursed our gods, insulted our religion, mocked our way of life, and accused our forefathers of error. Either you must stop him or you must let us get to him, for you yourself are in the same position as we are in opposition to him, and we will rid you of him. When the Quraysh perceived that Abu Talib had refused to give up the Prophet وسلم, and that he was resolved to part company with them, they went to him with Umar bin al-Walid bin al-Mughira and said, This is Umar, the strongest and most handsome young man among the Quraysh. Adopt him as a son and give us this nephew of yours who has opposed your religion and the religion of your fathers, severed the unity of your people and mocked our way of life, so that we may kill him. This will be a man for a man. Now let's continue on to page 120 to 133, where we can read how the Quraysh treated the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Then the Quraysh incited people against the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, who had become Muslims. Every tribe fell upon the Muslims among them, beating them and seducing them from their religion. Islam began to spread in Mecca among the men and women of the tribes of the Quraysh, though the Quraysh were imprisoning and seducing as many of the Muslims as they could. So here, we read that the Muslims were being beaten and imprisoned by the pagan Arabs so as to force them to apostate from Islam. Very peaceful pagans, right? Moving on to page 135, we read about yet another attempt at the Prophet's life wasallam. Abu Jahl spoke, making the usual charges against him, and saying, I call God to witness that I will wait for him tomorrow with a stone which I can hardly lift, and when he prostrates himself in prayer, I will split his skull open with it. When morning came, Abu Jahl took a stone and sat in wait for the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ prostrated himself, Abu Jahl took up the stone and went towards him, until when he got near him, he turned back in flight, pale with terror. The Quraysh asked him what had happened, and he replied that when he got near him, a camel stallion got in the way and scared him. I guess according to the masked Arab, the camel was a terrorist because it terrified Abu Jahl. Jokes aside, if we continue on page 142, we can read how the Muslims were treated if they recited the Qur'an in public. The first man to speak the Qur'an loudly in Mecca after the Prophet ﷺ was Abdullah bin Masud. And when they, the pagan Arabs, realized that he was reading some of what Muhammad ﷺ prayed, they got up and began to hit him in the face. But he continued to read so far as Allah willed for him to read. Continuing on pages 143 to 145, we read even more gruesome stories of how the Muslims were persecuted by the pagan Arabs. Then the Quraysh showed their enmity to all those who followed the Prophet ﷺ. Every clan which contained Muslims attacked them, imprisoning them and beating them, allowing them no food or drink, and exposing them to the burning heat of Mecca, so as to seduce them from their religion. Some gave way under pressure of persecution, and others resisted them, being protected by Allah. Bilal, a slave who was afterwards freed by Abu Bakr, was a faithful Muslim, pure of heart. Umayyah bin Khalif, his master, used to bring him out at the hottest part of the day and throw him on his back in the open valley and have a great rock put on his chest. Then he would say to him, You will stay here till you die or deny Muhammad wasallam and worship our gods. The Banu Makhzum used to take out Amr bin Yasser with his father and mother, who were Muslims, and expose them to the heat of Mecca. They killed his mother, for she refused to abandon Islam. In other Islamic sources, his mother's name is mentioned as Sumayya, and she is considered the first martyr in Islam. And how was she murdered? Well, according to those same sources, Abu Jahl impaled her with a spear through her private parts. This is nothing less than barbaric. Eventually, the persecution became so bad that many Muslims decided to migrate away from Mecca to Abyssinia, now known as modern-day Ethiopia. As we read on page 146, when the Prophet ﷺ saw the affliction of his companions, and though he escaped it because of his standing with Allah and his uncle Abu Talib, 
he could not protect them. So he said to them, If you were to go to Abyssinia, it would be better for you, for the king will not tolerate injustice, and it's a friendly country, until such a time as Allah shall relieve you from your distress. Thereupon his companions went to Abyssinia, being afraid of apostasy and fleeing to Allah with their religion. But the pagan Arabs weren't too happy with the Muslims leaving to find peace and security. So they sent an envoy to the king of Abyssinia to get them back. When the Quraysh saw that the Prophet ﷺ's companions were safe in Abyssinia and had found security there, they decided among themselves to send two determined men of their number to the Nejis, or the king, to get them sent back, so that they could seduce them from their religion and get them out of their homes in which they were living in peace. Thankfully, the king didn't listen to the pagan Arabs' demands and allowed the Muslims to remain under his security. But did that stop the pagan Arabs? Oh no. If we go to page 159, we read how the remaining Muslims were treated in Mecca. When the Quraysh perceived that the Prophet ﷺ's companions had settled in a land of peace and safety, and that the Nejis had protected those who sought refuge with him, and that Islam had begun to spread among the tribes, they came together and decided among themselves to write a document in which they should put a boycott on the Muslims, that they should not marry their women nor give women to them to marry, and that they should neither buy from them nor sell from them, and when they agreed on that, they wrote it in a deed. They, the Muslims, remained thus for two or three years until they were exhausted, nothing reaching them except what came from their friends unknown to the Quraysh. So here we read that the Muslims were basically forced into a situation where they were on the verge of starvation because the pagan Arabs had put a boycott on them. Now their cruelty was so bad that the surrounding tribes in the area actually felt sorry for the Muslims and pressured them to eventually lift the boycott. More people even became Muslim as a result. But this persecution continued for some time, until finally, we read on pages 212 to 213, that the Muslims were given the command to fight in order to protect themselves. The Prophet ﷺ had not been given permission to fight or allowed to shed blood. He had simply been ordered to call men to God and to endure insult and forgive the ignorant. The Quraysh had persecuted his followers, seducing some from their religion, and exiling others from their country. They had to choose whether to give up their religion, be maltreated at home, or to flee the country, some to Abyssinia, others to Medina. When the Quraysh became insolent towards Allah and rejected his gracious purpose, accused his Prophet ﷺ of lying, and ill-treated and exiled those who served him, he gave permission to his Prophet ﷺ to fight and to protect himself against those who wronged them and treated them badly. The first verse which was sent down on this subject was, Those who have been attacked are permitted to take up arms because they have been wronged. Allah has the power to help them, those who have been unjustly driven from their homes, only for saying our Lord is Allah. If Allah did not repel some people by means of others, many monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques where Allah's name is much invoked would have been destroyed. Allah is sure to help those who help his cause. Allah is strong and mighty. However, even after that, the Muslims did not engage in combat. Rather, they decided to first migrate to a settlement outside of Mecca, called Yathrib, known today as Medina. And to ensure they all left safely, the Prophet ﷺ stayed behind as the last to leave. And what did the Quraysh do? Did they realize the error of their ways and decide to make amends with the people they persecuted for no reason? No. Instead, they thought it would be a perfect time to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. We read on pages 221 to 224, when the Quraysh saw that the Prophet ﷺ had a party and companions not of their tribe and outside their territory, and that his companions had migrated to join them, and knew that they had settled in a new home and had gained protectors, they feared that the Prophet ﷺ might join them, since they knew that he had decided to fight them. So they assembled in their council chamber to take counsel what they should do in regard to the Prophet ﷺ, for they were now in fear of him. Thereupon, Abu Jahl said that he had a plan which had not been suggested yet. Namely, that each clan should provide a young, powerful, well-born aristocratic warrior, that each of these should be provided with a sharp sword, then that each of them should strike a blow at him and kill him in his sleep. Thankfully, they were not successful and the Prophet ﷺ was able to escape. Then the Quraysh decided to put a ransom on his head. When the Quraysh missed the Prophet ﷺ, they offered a hundred she-camels to anyone who would bring him back. And finally, we read the following on page 280. Then the Prophet ﷺ prepared for war in pursuance of Allah's command to fight his enemies and to fight those polytheists who were near at hand whom Allah commanded to fight. This was 13 years after his call. So here we find that the persecution lasted for 13 years. For 13 years the Muslims refused to fight the very people who beat them, tortured them, imprisoned them, exiled them, killed them, 
chased them as they were trying to run away, and even tried to assassinate their leader, the Prophet ﷺ himself. After 13 years, the Muslims finally decided to engage in battle. But according to the Mast Arab, the Battle of Badr, which takes place on page 289, was an unprovoked conflict initiated by the Muslims just because they wanted money. Right. Yeah, that's like ignoring the fact that Pearl Harbor happened, and then claiming that the United States attacked Japan unprovoked because, you know, they just wanted sushi. Moving on. How about the raid of Khaybar? When the apostle raided a people, he waited until the morning. If he heard a call to prayer, he held back. If he did not hear it, he attacked. I mean, just that sentence alone tells us he was targeting neighboring towns and villages randomly. He waits outside to see if they do the call to prayer or not. If they don't, it means they're not Muslim and he attacks them as a result. What kind of religion of peace is this? Is this meant to be defensive jihad? Really? Anyway, let's just keep reading. We came to Khaybar by night and the apostle passed the night there. And when morning came, he did not hear the call to prayer. So he rode and we rode with him and I rode behind Abu Talha with my foot touching the apostle's foot. We met the workers of Khaybar coming out in the morning with their spades and baskets. When they saw the apostle in the army, they cried, Muhammad with his force, and turned tail and fled. The apostle said, Allahu Akbar, Khaybar is destroyed. When we arrive in a people's square, it is a bad morning for those who have been warned. So he waits the night, doesn't hear the call to prayer. That confirms they are not Muslims in this town and therefore they have become fair game for him to attack. He's about to attack and these poor people are waking up and walk out with their spades and baskets, just trying to make a living. They see Muhammad's army and they run for their lives. How can a Muslim apologist tell us jihad was only defensive when we have an abundance of stories like this? Here, the Mast Arab claims that the Jewish settlement of Khaybar was just randomly attacked because they happened to be disbelievers. Mind you, disbelieving civilians who apparently carried around children's beach toys. Nice imagery there, the Mast Arab, but we're not going to fall for that. Once again, when we decide to actually read the source he's quoting from, we get a very different picture. So instead of starting at the beginning of this conquest on page 511, let's go back and start with page 361. Here, we read that after the Battle of Badr, Abu Sufyan, one of the leaders of the Quraysh, requested the help of a Jewish tribe called Banu Nadr. When Abu Sufyan returned to Mecca and the Quraysh fugitives returned from Badr, he swore that he would not practice ablution or cleansing until he had raided Muhammad Accordingly, he sallied forth with 200 riders from the Quraysh to fulfill his vow. Then he sallied forth by night and came to the Banu Nadr under cover of darkness. Then he went to Salam bin Mishkam, who was their chief at the time, and keeper of the public purse. He asked permission to come in and Salam entertained him with food and drink, and gave him secret information about the Muslims. He, Abu Sufyan, then rejoined his companions at the end of the night and sent some of them to Medina. They came to an outlying district called Al-Uraid, and there they burnt some young palm trees and finding one of the helpers of the Prophet wasallam and an ally of his working in the field there, they killed them and returned. People got warning of them and so the Prophet wasallam went out in pursuit, but Abu Sufyan and his companions had eluded him. So basically, this tribe of Jews gave Abu Sufyan some secrets about the Muslims, most likely regarding the location of their farms. And then, Abu Sufyan proceeded to destroy those resources and murder innocent farmers. The Banu Nadr never really liked the Muslims and felt that they were losing power and influence as a result of the popularity of Islam. So they often assisted the pagans who were fighting them. But you may ask, what does this have to do with Khaybar? Well, let's continue reading on page 437 to find out. The Prophet ﷺ went to Banu Nadr to ask for their help in paying the blood wit for two men of Banu Amr. There was a mutual alliance between Banu Nadr and Banu Amr. When the Prophet ﷺ came to them about the blood wit, they said that of course they would contribute in any way he wished. But they took counsel with one another apart, saying, We will never get such a chance again. Who will go to the top of the house and drop a rock on him, so as to kill him and rid us of him? The Prophet ﷺ was sitting by the wall of one of their houses at the time. So Amr bin Jihash bin Ka'ab volunteered to do this and went up to throw down a rock. But news came to him from heaven about what these people intended, so he got up. The Prophet ﷺ then ordered them, the Muslims, to prepare for war and to march against them. They, the Banu Nadr, asked the Prophet ﷺ to deport them and to spare their lives on condition that they could retain all their property, which they could carry on camels, except their armor. And he agreed. Some of them went to Khaybar and others went to Syria. Among their chiefs who went to Khaybar was Salam bin Abul Hukayak, Kinana bin Rabi bin Abul Hukayak, and Huay bin Akhtab. When they got there, the inhabitants became subject to them. 
So here we read that the Prophet ﷺ was trying to mediate between the Banu Nadr and the Banu Amr regarding a dispute. And instead of complying, the representatives of the Banu Nadr decided they were going to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ found out what they were doing, whether through divine intervention or otherwise, he then declared war on them. However, it didn't really materialize and the Banu Nadr were allowed to leave. What's most interesting about this story though, is that some of their leaders ended up going to Khaybar, where they basically conquered the inhabitants there and took over. Starting to see the pieces fall into place here? Let's continue. If we jump ahead to the Battle of the Trench, we read that the Banu Nadr assisted the pagan Arabs in this conflict. And remember, the masked Arab himself claimed that this battle was a defensive one for the Muslims. A number of Jews who had formed a party against the Prophet wasallam, among whom were Salam bin Abu Hukayek al-Nadri, al huwey bin Akhtab al-Nadri, and Kinana bin Abu Hukayek al-Nadri, they went to the Quraysh at Mecca and invited them to join them in an attack on the Prophet wasallam, so that they might get rid of him altogether. And they, the Quraysh, responded gladly to their invitation to fight the Prophet wasallam, and they assembled and made their preparations. Thankfully, the Muslims were not overrun and were able to fight another day. But what should be clear by now is that the people of Khaybar, or should I say the tribe of Banu Nadr, were not just some random disbelievers the Muslims just felt like attacking one day for no good reason. In summary, the masked Arab has once again deceived his credulous audience, because he knows they won't bother to read anything beyond what he puts on screen. Moving on. In order to try and prove their point, apologists will often repeat verses like these around to try and pull the wool over your eyes. There is no compulsion in religion. Fight in the cause of Allah those who fight you, but do not transgress limits, for Allah loveth not transgressors. But the problem with these verses is that they are widely believed to have been cancelled out by later verses within the Muslim concept of abrogation, which tries to explain all the contradictions by suggesting the verses revealed later supersede the earlier ones if they contradict each other. Here, the masked Arab claims that it is widely believed that all the peaceful verses in the Qur'an have been abrogated. But as we've already seen in the previous episode, his own references refute him. For example, when we look at Surah 2 verse 190, we know that one of the masked Arab's favorite scholars, Ibn Kathir, states openly that said abrogation is not plausible. And even those scholars who do believe that said verses are abrogated, such as Imam Qurtabi, they do not believe that abrogation lifts the prohibition of killing innocent people. That said, I'm a little confused as to why the masked Arab claims that abrogation is a Muslim concept, quote-unquote, invented for the sake of explaining away supposed contradictions in the Qur'an. And why am I confused? Because the Qur'an itself promotes the concept of abrogation, explaining it as a product of the revelation being revealed gradually over time. When we substitute one revelation for another, and Allah knows best what he reveals, they say, you're just making it up. But most of them have no knowledge. Say that the Holy Spirit, Jibreel, alayhi salam, has brought the revelation with the truth step by step from your Lord, to strengthen the believers and as a guidance and good news to the devout. In another verse, Allah says, any revelation we cause to be superseded or forgotten, we replace with something better or similar. Do you, Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, not know that Allah has power over everything? So the Qur'an itself answers the masked Arab by stating that abrogation is part and parcel of its very being. So the fact that he would even say such a thing really puts into question his credibility as a so-called expert on Islam. Moving on. We are told by the major exegetes of the Qur'an that this verse has been abrogated by later verses which command the killing of non-believers. We only need to look at how Islam's biggest scholars interpreted them. Here's what Imam Tabari reports for the infamous There is no compulsion in religion verse. There is no compulsion in religion means that the Arabs who had no monotheist religion were forced into religion by the sword, whereas the Jews, Christians and the Majans, Zoroastrians, are not forced if they pay the jizya. So there is no compulsion for other monotheists to join Islam if they are willing to pay the jizya tax. For the rest of the non-believers, the options are to join Islam or be killed. Yes, many exegetes consider this verse to be abrogated, but once again, the masked Arab is not mentioning some important details. In fact, it appears he's not even consistent when he's cherry-picking. To clarify, Imam Tabari, the 9th to 10th century scholar and Quranic exegete, did in fact say that this verse was abrogated. But unlike the masked Arab, he does not say here that all disbelievers outside the mentioned groups 
should be forced to convert to Islam, just the pagan Arabs. The fact that the masked Arab thinks the Arab pagans equal every other disbeliever is such a lapse of logic that even I feel embarrassed for him. That said, what makes the masked Arab's use of Imam Tabari's commentary more interesting, if not slightly ironic, is that it confirms our analysis in the previous episode regarding his use of the following hadith. We see this authentic hadith that really makes it obvious that Islam was aggressively spreading by the sword and threatening non-Muslims to either convert, pay the jizya, or be killed. But it was also threatening Muslims who weren't good enough in his eyes. Allah's Messenger said, I have been ordered by Allah to fight against the people until they testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and that Muhammad is Allah's Messenger, and offer the prayers perfectly and give the obligatory charity. So if they perform that, then they save their lives and property from me. Here he says clearly he has been ordered to fight against the people, referring to them in a general sense, unless they become Muslims, which still isn't enough. They also need to offer prayers perfectly and pay zakat to the state and only then will their lives and property be safe from Muhammad. You see, the masked Arab claims that the phrase the people here refers to all mankind. Now, while it is true that a definite article can refer to a universal subject, this isn't usually the case. You see, the phrase the people must be specific here, because as Imam Tabari clearly shows, only the pagan Arabs were forced to be Muslim. The Hadith itself even hints at this because it neglects to mention the jizya, which only the monotheist and other religions outside of Arabia could pay. So yet again, the masked Arab's own reference contradicts him. But for those of you who still may be skeptical, allow me to provide yet another hadith that shows that the definite article here is about a specific subject and not a universal one. In another hadith collection by Imam Ahmed al-Nasai, it states the following. It was narrated from Anas bin Malik that the Prophet wasallam said, I have been commanded to fight the idolaters until they bear witness to La ilaha illallah. In summary, the master refutes himself again. How quaint. Moving on. The Quran contains a number of peaceful verses which were revealed when Islam was weak and trying to establish itself. The more violent and aggressive verses all came when the Muslims had grown in number and power. I think this verse sums this up pretty neatly. And be not slack as to cry for peace and you have the upper hand. This verse clearly tells us that Muslims should not be calling for peace when they are in a position of strength. This explains why Islam began with peaceful verses, but then they all got cancelled out when they were emboldened enough through strength. So much for this being the religion of peace. The Quran clearly states that you should not call for peace if you have the upper hand. I don't really understand what the problem is here, because it's completely outside the realm of reason to offer peace when you have the upper hand in war. I mean, how could any sensible person allow their enemies to regroup and gain strength? How much of a delusional pacifist do you have to be to think it's a good idea to offer peace to an opponent who absolutely refuses to stop fighting you? Hey! 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 Stop it! Stop it! Okay. Okay? Okay. All right. Seriously, how is this even an argument to begin with? Moving on. Let's look at more examples which glorify jihad. In this hadith, Muhammad makes it clear that to kill people and be killed is the best thing a Muslim can hope to do. By the being in whose hand is Muhammad's life, I love to fight in the way of Allah and be killed, to fight and again be killed, and to fight again and be killed. In another hadith, Muhammad says, He who dies without having fought or having felt fighting against the infidels to be his duty will die guilty of a kind of hypocrisy. So Muhammad labels those who do not fight as hypocrites, and the Quran threatens hypocrites with the worst type of torture in hell. Chapter 4 verse 145 reads, Surely the hypocrites are in the lowest stage of the fire, and you shall not find a helper for them. So now, aside from the incentives of virgins in the afterlife if you die fighting for Islam, you are now being told if you don't fight, you can be considered a hypocrite. You know what? Awesome. I have absolutely zero problems with any of this. That said, allow me to drop a truth bomb. Islam is not a religion of peace. Hmm, that's better. Now. But before anyone claims victory over my admission and assumes that Islam must therefore be about total war, this is also false. You see, Islam is not a religion of peace because it doesn't preach pacifism. 
which is a horribly immoral doctrine that allows for warmongers to exist and perpetuate their crimes unopposed. Rather, Islam is a religion of balance, which deals with reality, of which includes both peace and war. As such, there will naturally be passages that glorify courage, honor, and determination in battle against the enemy, as well as passages that condemn cowardice and desertion from one's duties. Any civilization that doesn't do this won't survive very long. That said, let me make this easier for my viewers to understand. When faced with a military conflict, who would you rather have on your side? People like this, or some skinny jeans mask wearing pacifist. I don't know about you guys, but this doesn't seem like a tough decision. Whether the hadith refers only to Muhammad's time or for all times is contested among classical Muslim scholars, but we can certainly see how one can see it to be an eternal command, especially with authentic hadiths like this one around. I heard the Messenger of Allah say, a group of people from my ummah will continue to fight in defense of truth and remain triumphant until the Day of Judgment. Naturally, the masked Arab doesn't bother to show us the disagreement between the scholars regarding the aforementioned hadith and Quranic passages, but simply informs us that there was a disagreement. And since he doesn't show any references for this claim, it's difficult to scrutinize his use of those sources, so I will refrain from addressing it at this time. That said, judging by his past work, it would probably be unsurprising that he left it out because it was not convenient enough for him to cherry pick. However, I will not go down the same path as the masked Arab. Instead, I will explain the nature of jihad through some of its top scholars of Islamic jurisprudence, and then explain its supposed perpetuity. First, let's begin by examining a 12th century intermediate level textbook on Islamic law called The Distinguished Jurist Primer, written by the eminent Islamic jurist Ibn Rushd. Now, while Ibn Rushd is most well known among lay people for his philosophical acumen, he has been traditionally regarded among Muslim scholars as one of the greatest Islamic jurists of all time. This is why his textbook is still used today in traditional madrasa when learning about comparative law. Now, this work is quite important because it documents the disagreements among jurists regarding certain matters up until the 12th century, and is comprehensive in scope. However, most interesting is the fact that Ibn Rushd never documents any disagreements between the scholars regarding the perpetuity of jihad. Nowhere is such a discussion even mentioned in passing. That said, he states the reason for war very explicitly. Why wage war? The Muslim jurist agreed that the purpose of fighting the people of the book, excluding the Qurayshi people of the book and Christian Arabs, is one of two things. It is either for their conversion to Islam or the payment of jizya, or tribute. The payment of jizya is because of the words of Allah, fight against such of those who have been given the scripture and believe not in Allah or the last day, and forbid not that which Allah and his messenger have forbidden, and follow not the religion of truth, until they pay the tribute and are humbled. That explains everything, right? Well, not really, because there are internal and external nuances that have yet to be mentioned. For example, regarding the internal nuances, Ibn Rushd also goes into detail on the issue of treaties. Is truce permissible? A group of jurors permitted this initially without warfare, without necessity, if the imam, i.e. the leader, considered it to be in the interest of the Muslims. Another group of jurors did not permit it, except on the basis of a compelling necessity, such as the avoidance of disturbances by the enemy, or for gaining from them some concessions for the Muslim community. Here, we find that the scholars agreed that treaties were permissible, but disagreed on when such treaties could be issued, largely based on pragmatic reasons. We also find here implicitly stated that along with scripture, some external nuances played a major role in Muslim conduct of warfare. And this is not surprising when someone has a basic understanding of Islamic jurisprudence and history. Commenting on the major influences behind the Islamic conception of warfare, Fred Donner, professor of Near Eastern History, elucidates some of the hidden clauses. However, it seems doubtful that one can fully understand the attitude of a particular civilization, in this case Islamic civilization, toward a phenomenon as complex and as fundamental to human society as war, merely by examining the juridical and theological definition of war and its status. The juridical definition, of course, has been a major force in shaping the reactions of Muslims towards war over the centuries, but it would be rash to assume that it has been the only one. The attitudes of the first generations of Muslims towards questions of war and peace were shaped by several factors. Paramount among them were a. the cultural norms of the pre-Islamic societies to which they belonged, b. the attitudes towards war contained implicitly or explicitly in the Qur'an, and c. the dramatic events in their own lifetimes. 
all of these factors contributed to the formation of the classical Islamic conception of war. In this society, war, or harb, used in the senses both of an activity and of a condition, was in one sense a normal way of life, that is, a state of war was assumed to exist between one's own tribe and all others, unless a particular treaty or agreement had been reached with another tribe establishing amicable relations. The society that Donner speaks of here was not only applicable to the Muslim's immediate context, but was the state of the entire world at the time, an age of empires. And what is an empire? Empires are defined by center-periphery relations, hierarchical inclusion, and claims to universal legitimacy. Thus, they know no natural borders and may potentially cover the entire globe and bring civilization, Christianity, Islam, or revolutionary progress to all of humanity, irrespective of the ethno-national background of the population. Empires show an institutionalized drive to expand their domain through conquest, even if at high military, political, and economic cost. Claims to universal legitimacy make the extension of the imperial domain a benchmark for judging the success of the military political elite. In summary then, when the Muslims rose to power in the 7th century, they had to contend with a world which natural state was war. In other words, the concepts of defensive and offensive jihad, a demarcation between warfare fought in self-defense and unprovoked warfare, is an anachronism and does not reflect the actual context behind the classical legalities of jihad. It has only been less than a century since the last empire existed, and a state of peace has become the default around the world. Before this period, this was not the case. Jihad for the Muslims was technically always defensive, because there was no other way to survive, unless of course they signed a peace treaty. Unfortunately, due to this ignorance of history and how Islamic law operates, people like the masked Arab see the religion as some cruel anomaly surrounded by a bunch of pacifist hippies who did absolutely nothing to provoke the Muslims, and were just randomly attacked because of their disbelief. Not surprisingly, this same ignorance is shared by ISIS. But what I think is most ironic about this is that the very society the masked Arab holds up as the height of civilization was itself built on offensive jihad, albeit a far more cruel and exploitive form of jihad than Islam would ever allow. That said, I will undoubtedly come across the objection that because Islam is a religion for all time, all legal rulings related to it must be static, regardless of the changing conditions of society. But this doesn't make any sense, because for a religion to be for all time, it must be able to address changing circumstances throughout time. And while Islam has certain rules that never change, such as with regard to prayer, fasting, etc., much of its judicial tradition is dependent on circumstance as exhibited in Ibn Rushd's documentation of scholarly disagreements regarding peace treaties. This is also why later scholars, such as the 19th to 20th century Egyptian jurist, Muhammad Abu Zahra, issued the following fatwa regarding the establishment of the United Nations. It is essential to note that the world today is united under a single organization where each member state adheres to its terms and conditions. The Islamic ruling in this case is that it is obliged to fulfill all agreements and treaties that the Islamic lands commit themselves to as is stipulated by the law of fulfilling treaties endorsed by the Qur'an. Based on this, those non-Muslim countries that are members of this world organization are not deemed as the abode of war, or Dar al-Harb. Instead, they should be seen as the abodes of truce, or Dar al-Ahad. Moving on. There are plenty of verses in the Qur'an that command fighting. Many of you are familiar with them already, so I won't go into too much detail here, but here's one example. Fighting is enjoined on you, and it is an object of dislike to you, and it may be that you dislike a thing while it is good for you, and it may be that you love a thing while it is evil for you, and Allah knows while you do not know. This verse sums up the problem with religion, and Islam in particular, in a nutshell. It basically says, we have ordered you to fight, even though you might not want to. And at the end of the verse it tells us, God knows and you don't, so therefore we should never question his judgment and ask why. Just listen and obey. This is why it's so difficult to reform and why it's so easy for violence to breed within Islam. It says it here, Allah knows and we don't, so who are we to question? Who are we to change these commands or water them down? Another quick example, chapter 61 verse 10. O oh, you who believe, shall I lead you to a merchandise which may deliver you from a painful chastisement? You shall believe in Allah and his messenger, and struggle hard in Allah's way with your property and your lives. That is better for you, did you but know. The word used in Arabic for struggle hard in that verse is tujahiduna, which is a variation of jihad. So those who do jihad with their lives and their properties, meaning their wealth, will avoid a painful torment in hell. Wow. Talk about exaggeration. 
So according to the Mast Arab, these verses prove that religion is problematic because it orders Muslims to fight and encourages them not to feel scared about fighting. Apparently, after reading this verse, Muslims magically become terrorists or something. Well, thankfully, the Mast Arab is here to save us all from this fate. Thank you, Mast Arab. Without you, so many of us would have become terrorists by now. Said no one ever. One last verse. Chapter 2, verse 193. And fight with them until there is no persecution, and religion should be only for Allah. But if they desist, then there should be no hostility except against the oppressors. Let's read what this means. I mean, on paper it looks okay. It tells Muslims to stop fighting if the other side give up, which is kind of common sense. But as always, we have a clause. You can't be hostile and aggressive against people if they're not fighting you, unless they're oppressors. Well, who is an oppressor? And the commentary by Tabari on this verse says, with this verse, God means if they stop, that is, if they stop fighting, embrace your faith and carry out what your faith requires and left the worshipping of idols. Then you can stop fighting them and aggressing against them. This is because you cannot start conflict only against the oppressors, and they are the polytheists. So we can see clearly here that you must continue to fight until they become Muslims and carry out all that Islam requires them to do, from prayers to fasting, etc. This is also supported in the commentary of Ibn Kathir where he says, but if they cease... Let there be no transgression except against the wrongdoers. Indicates that if they stop their shirk, which means polytheism, and fighting the believers, then cease warfare against them. Shirk is the Arabic word for polytheism. So a second major exegete of the Quran confirms that fighting should not stop unless they stop worshipping any gods beside Allah. So it's clear fighting non-believers must continue forever. This is at least the case within Sunni Islam. Well, according to the Mast Arab and his use of Imam Tabari prior, this refers specifically to the pagan Arabs, who, as we've already noted in the previous episode, broke their treaty with the Muslims by beginning hostilities. So once again, the masked Arab invalidates his own claims by way of his very own references. In summary, the masked Arab has not shown a direct link between Islam and ISIS. Rather, all he's proven is that ISIS cherry-picks just as badly as he does. That said, maybe this was the masked Arab's plan all along. Maybe this entire time, he hasn't been arguing for what Islam actually teaches, but how ISIS uses Islamic sources to suit their own agenda. But if this is really his argument, then how can one claim that Islam is the primary reason behind their actions? Cherry picking doesn't automatically become less fallacious when you use it on religion. It is still an invalid measure by which to determine influence. To suggest otherwise would merely be a case of committing the fallacy of special pleading which is applying a general principle to various situations, but not applying it to a special situation that interests the arguer, even though the general principle properly applies to that special situation as well. However, I'm sure someone will object by appealing to postmodernist apologetics, claiming that Islam is whatever people want it to be. Therefore, every interpretation is valid. But this is nonsense, because Islam is not whatever people want it to be, and every interpretation is not valid. If the opposite were true, then there would be no Islam to talk about, because putting together a bunch of mutually exclusive interpretations under one umbrella doesn't magically equate to a coherent concept. Even so, I would find it ironic if this objection was made, because when people like the masked Arab suggest that Islam promotes terrorism, or Islam promotes extremism, or Islam promotes this or that, they don't have in mind a bunch of different Islams. No, no, no. They only have in mind one Islam. It's only when they are corrected that Islam suddenly becomes a rainbow of different interpretations immune to criticism. How convenient. That said, I anticipate that the masked Arab is going to respond to my criticisms. Some have already confirmed this. And honestly, I can understand why. I mean, there's a lot to lose here. 1,500 US dollars for every video? And a dream of becoming a full-time internet superhero that combats the evils of religion. A much respected career path, I'm sure. But what would I know? For several years, I spent my life in Malaysia working with policy institutes and assisting the Malaysian government with counterterrorism strategies. As I studied and worked there, I was invited on numerous occasions to speak publicly against ISIS and their affiliates, all the while teaching young Muslims about the dangers and fallacies of extremism. As a result, I was met with real-life threats from ISIS supporters themselves often gruesome declarations of how I would be dismembered if I continued. I'm ISIS, so I will be discussing them at length as well throughout this lecture. 
I hear there may be some supporters in the university, so if you wish to kill me, please do so afterwards so that I can finish my talk. That'd be greatly appreciated. However, despite this, I never once felt compelled to wear a mask, or to try and make a career out of being a victim. I guess conviction and a genuine concern for the well-being of others were much bigger priorities for me. With all that said, I want to thank my viewers for watching. Until next time, Jazakallah khaira, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.